Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for all joining us today for the 2021 Latin America webinar. My name is Christy Zelinka and I'm one of the program coordinators in the Global Connect department here at WUSADA. As you may already know, it is WUSADA's vision to see agriculture businesses from the Western US flourish in the global marketplace. In the last year and a half, there have been many challenges. We've had to cancel and postpone our normal activities and rethink how we offer our services. We've adapted to the virtual world, offering virtual buying missions, as, way as, as well as creating new ways to connect our suppliers with foreign buyers, such as virtual meetings, chef demos, restaurant promotions, and more. Another way we are trying, oh, next slide, thank you. Um, another way we are trying to assist our US companies is providing relevant up-to-date market data by sharing infographics provided by our in-country contractors. The infographics can be found on the social media platforms you see on your screen, and they're updated monthly. It's a great way to get a snapshot of the segments growing within a market, new trends, updates on travel, and more. Again, you can find them on our social media platforms, so don't forget to follow Usada. Okay, next slide. At this time, I'd like to welcome Marco Alvaron and Arturo Palacios from IMALINX. Marco has 25 years of experience in corporate and international business, and he is the head of IMALINX. Arturo has a bachelor's degree in business and has spent four years at IMALINX managing international programs in Mexico and Central America. Marco and Arturo, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Okay. Thank you, Christy. Uh, you want to start? Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us on this uh, market update and retail update webinar. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces, some familiar names are at the uh, participants list. So let's just get started. Um, so first of all, uh, about Emailings. So you know, most of you know us. For the ones that don't know us, we are an international go-to-market firm for the produce, food, and beverage industries. We develop marketing strategies to facilitate your access to the hearts of Latin America. Um, our emailing services are market intelligence, trade missions, trade marketing programs, consumer programs, communications. Um, we've worked with some of you on, on these trade missions and these marketing programs. We've been working with USADA some, for some years now. Um, we're USADA's in-country contractors. And uh, so basically, we want to cover some points with you today, uh, basic perspectives for 2021. We, we're going to give you the COVID update, you know, the subject of the past uh, two years, uh, retail changes in Mexico, sample shipping, and finally, we will uh, finish the session with some, Q with some questions and answers. So if you, if you may uh, start sending questions, we can uh, be answering your questions at the end. So you're going to find below on your screen um, uh, a place where you can just type in your questions and we'll read them at the end. Thank you. So Mexico, uh, we have 31 states, one district capital. So this is some general information about Mexico. You'll see a uh, surface, our GDP, is, is, our GDP is lower, of course, than last year uh, due to COVID. Um, we, you know, as many, many countries, uh, Mexico was one that got hit by COVID. Um, our inflation is at 6%. Last year, we were at 4%. Uh, unemployment is 4.09%. Last year, we were at 2%. So... This is, uh, these numbers are being um, affected by COVID, but we expect that these numbers will get back on track in the, in the upcoming five years. So what is happening in Mexico? So as you may, may have seen in Mexico and most of the countries, um, COVID-19 basically stopped all presidential activities and, and all type promotions. So basically it was a boom for shopping apps in Mexico and the world. In Mexico, we had a, an increase um, of consumers going to e-commerce platforms and purchasing their groceries online, as well as using these uh, shopping apps more than they used to, you know, being at home. And uh, it, it, this is one um, cause that had COVID on, on Mexico. This is an impact that had COVID on Mexico. So on, during the first half of this year, the revenues have grown 192%. Another update that we have in Mexico is business is returning to normal and very quickly. 
the market is opening. So we are coming back to business and the, marketing is, the market is opening quickly. We are seeing that uh, buyers are, are starting to going back on, on travels and um, trying to open business again. So, uh, so far on the COVID, we, are, we have 179 million 63 COVID doses. Uh, so we have a total of 107 million 63 people vaccinated in Mexico. We're, it's a slow process in Mexico, but we're getting there. Arturo, if, if I may, uh, just, uh, can you go back a little? Yes. Just one, please. Uh, yes, and uh, obviously the numbers look very positive, and that, those are the official numbers. But if you see, these are the available uh, doses that will be, the doses that will be available in the country in the next month. And we already have 1 million people vaccinated, but that can count for one person going for two shots that counts as two people. So the number that we have in feared is that basically 40% of our population has been vaccinated, which is a low number compared to the US. But that low number compared to the cases that we have, it seems to be balancing the, you know, the, the situation in general. And uh, it, it looks better. Uh, as Arturo says, you know, we are going back to normal. Actually, we marked uh, August 16th as the start of the return. And we have trade shows. We have uh, trade missions. Uh, travel between the U.S. and Mexico will resume in the next weeks. Uh, and the cases in life in general looks normal, you know, and I'll quote. Uh, but obviously, everybody everybody's wearing uh, masks and, and uh, taking uh, precautions. We're not there yet, but it looks better. And Arturo will show in a minute how things look in a, in a numer numeric perspective. Thank you. So, so far, this is, uh, so far in October, we have 3,725,242 confirmed cases. Um, this is below, you can see a graph of the new cases in Mexico as of October 13th. As you can see, we have, we're going as a decline. Um, we expect to have this decline. We hope to have this decline throughout the year. And um, obviously e-commerce grew 80%, 81% due to COVID as well as digital promotions showed more effectivity. We've seen that with COVID, um, everything went digital, promotions, everything was digital. So this was uh, one obvious uh, effect that COVID had in, in Mexico. So e-commerce, digital promotions are what they, what's booming right now in Mexico. So here's, a, as you may know, in Mexico, we have a red light traffic system to, um, to implement restrictions in each state. So basically, it, this, is, this system is updated every week. So this is the current uh, traffic system in Mexico, where you have green to red. Green means open as usual, business is open as normal. Um, in between you have a yellow and orange, which is some restrictions and red is complete lockdown or restrictions. So as you can see that in Mexico, we are, um, we're pretty good on the, um, on the traffic system. Business is going back to normal. Market is, market is opening, which is good for business. Yes, uh, but again, if you had seen that Six, week, six weeks ago, all yellows were orange and all greens were yellow. So it was a different landscape. So uh, it's coming up fast. And I think that's something that we will keep repeating, how fast things are moving and obviously the impact that you are seeing uh, with other markets we have it too here in Mexico. So we have three out of 10 Mexicans, they decrease the frequency of going out to get their groceries. Um, we're seeing that they are staying at home more than they used to. You know, we have as well um, home office. So consumers are staying more at home. They're looking up more things online. They're buying online, doing e-commerce. So this is um, one thing that is gonna be, this is gonna be, we expect this to stay the same uh, in the upcoming years. People are gonna start using more and more of these apps and e-commerce and they will stop, they will reduce their visits to supermarkets slightly. So Mexico's restrictions are easing up as well. Trade members are looking back to get back, are looking to get back to business. 
So moving on to this exchange rate, as you can see, exchange rate is one of the main uh, aspects that hit Mexico and the imports in Mexico. Exchange rate is um, the key factor for importers when they are trying to uh, bring product to Mexico. So this is one thing that when the, with COVID started, it actually, the impact was more on exchange rate than any other thing. So as you can see, we have uh, a comparison between the Mexican peso, the Brazilian real, and the Colombian peso. So we are seeing that the, uh, in the past two weeks, one month, we have an increase of the exchange rate, but compared to what we were seeing on 2020, this exchange rate is very um, stable. So um, as you can see below, we have a graph of the imports from October, 2020 to July, 2021. Um, in May, 2021, exports grew 125.2% and the imports 87.5%. Both increases are the highest since there is a record. Uh, obviously as uh, with the exchange rate during 2020, the imports um, took a huge blow. So as you can see, the countries getting back to normal, it's getting back to business and, and imports are starting to get back on track. So where is Mexico exporting? Mainly our trade partner is the US, United States. Then we have Canada, then we have Germany, and we have China as well. So mainly, as you can see, this is a great opportunity for United States trade. Um, we have a lot of trade, um, a lot of trade opportunity with the United States. Our total country trade is 419 billion. Also, where is Mexico importing from? So here you can see that the United States is still the largest partner, 51%, but we have more players in the industry. We have China, we have South Korea, Germany, and Japan as one of the main players that are in that are sending products into Mexico. So our total country trade is at 366 billion, sorry. Yes, no, that's fine, thank you. Now, one of the things, the, the, the opportunity that we have is that, uh, especially with Europe, uh, due to the supply chain constraints, uh, you know, worldwide, having the US using ground transportation, we have an advantage. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's open and it's quick, but we are hearing some more opportunity, we're, we're hearing opportunities of substituting products that usually came from the from Europe and bring them from the states. Again, it's uh, it's not as easy as it looks, and also we have to face the regular transit or you know increasing traffic that we have in this uh, end of the year. So there's an opportunity, but we understand that there are challenges too. Uh, something to keep in mind. Thank you, Michael. Okay, we're gonna move on to retail in Mexico. I'm gonna give you a little bit of an update on what's happening in retail in Mexico. So this is the numbers of stores in Mexico until March, 2021. Um, so as you can see, we have retail, we have department stores and we have specialist, specialist stores. So we are, we are seeing that um, specialist stores are having an increase in Mexico. Uh, there, there's an increase in Mexico, as you can see, we have uh, 91% of the stores in Mexico are specialty stores. And we have retail stores, which is 5%, and the department stores, which accounts for 4%. On this graph, you will find the national chains and the local regional chains. And you're gonna find the number of stores that they have in the Mexico City metropolitan area and the central, north, northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest areas in Mexico and the total of stores that each chain has in Mexico. So as you can see, Walmart is our leader, is the current leader in Mexico, but we are seeing growth in most of the specialty stores, which uh, one of the main um, stores that we want to touch is La Comer and City Market will be getting there eventually. But that's one specialty store that has had growth in Mexico and it's very recommended for specialty products, gourmet products and specialized products. So as you can see, we have the regional chains as well. We have Calimax, Super del Norte, Smart, which they account for a good segment of the market. They might, have, they might not have bigger volumes. They still have a good uh, segment of the market. 
So here you see the, uh, the national regional. We have the type of, uh, of the stores that we have. We have price clubs. We have, we have hypermarkets, mega market. We have warehouse. We have supermarkets and convenience stores. So each, you're gonna, have, you're gonna find um, an example to the right. We have Sam's Club, Costco, City Club, which account for the price clubs in Mexico. Then you have the hypermarket, hyper mega market, which is Walmart, uh, Mega Comercio Mexicana, La Comer, uh, Chedraui. Then we have warehouses, which is low cost um, supermarkets, which are Bodega Aurrera, Bodega Comercial, and Mercado Soriana. Then we have supermarkets. You have Superama, Sumesa, Walmart, Soriana. And then you have the convenience stores, OXO, 7-Eleven, and Bodega Express. So this yes, is- Arthur. Yes, go I'm ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry, I, I keep interrupting you. Uh, go ahead. We have one question and uh, somebody's asking if uh, Sam's Club is part of the Walmart num overall number. Yes, yes. That would be Walmix accounts for all Walmarts and Superamas as well. So it is included. Okay, perfect. Thank now, you. the the comment that I wanted to make is that every all, all the uh, the the fight the the, the market is uh, being fought at the supermarket level, which, as it says, are uh, smaller stores, premium products, or they have regular you know the regular offering, but they have some uh, specialty items, just as Arturo mentioned, uh, with a markup of ten to fifteen percent. So they rely on the discretionary expense of the buyer and on the experience. Now, two, three main things have happened in the last year. Obviously, e-commerce, that's something that Arturo already talked about. But there's a big player now, which is small in number of stores, but it's Grupo La Comer or Comercial. Those who have been in the market for long, and I see a few, remember Comercial Mexicana or Comercial Mexicana um, being a big player in Central Mexico. They have, a, they have about 250 stores uh, they went in this neighborhood supermarket uh, fashion, just like a Vaughn or an Albertsons in the U.S., and they sold part of their share to a, not, to a competitor. That competitor didn't do well, and basically they just, they just faded. But the, the Comercial Mexicana, they uh, changed the, the company, and I, now they're called La Comer, or a you know, short name for Comercial or Commercial. La Comer, and they manage these uh, city markets, which I always say they're like uh, Whole Foods on steroids. They have a uh, Sumesa and they have Fresco. So those with fewer stores are having higher margins and they're attracting competitors or they're attracting their competitors to change the format so they can have something similar, especially on the regional stores. So this supermarket segment is the one that is growing, uh, as Arturo, I think you mentioned that before, uh, but that's where you know the, the the movement is coming. Now Walmart, they realized that they couldn't find it, fight anymore, and now they changed their Superama stores, their Superama brand, which is premium, whatever. Now they they are switching it to Walmart Express because they think that the, the Walmart the Walmart brand is stronger than Superama, so they're pretty much using the Walmart brand, but on the other side, there's, they, they're staying clear from their competitors because they saw that they don't have that value that the others have. So again, sorry for interrupting. No, thank you. Okay, so here you will see uh, an example, a physical example of each store. You have, you have the price clubs, you have the mega markets, and uh, the warehouse, which is Bodega Herrera. You have the supermarket, so this is Superama, what Mark is talking about. It's going to be switching. And we have convenience stores, which are just small um, chain uh, corner stores with like OXO and 7-Eleven. So moving to Walmart. So Walmart has a solid financial position. Um, they're growing. They have aggressive terms as well. And this year they have opened 23 stores in the country. And so far they have 3,000 538 units in operation, and of which 2,677 are in Mexico. So they, it, every, most of the retailers in, during the pandemic, they showed an increase in sales because of COVID, of COVID purchasing during the first trimester of the, of the pandemic in 2020. They started to see an increase because consumers would buy more and expend more money on their groceries. 
So they're leading the market because of the early implementation of e-commerce and becoming omni-channel. That's one advantage that Walmart is having. And most of the, um, of the competitors are trying to, um, to do the same. So basically, they, they were the ones, the first ones in Mexico to implement e-commerce and became omnichannel, which gave, in, gave them a huge advantage when it comes to e-commerce and gaining more consumers in Mexico. And they are continuing to innovate. They just announced a program called Scan and Go that will be applied in its 160, 165 sorry, Sam's Club price clubs in the country. So this will be, this is something that you have already in the US and that it's slowly uh, getting into Mexico. This trend is slowly starting in Mexico, having people scanning for their items themselves and paying themselves just like a self-checkout. This is something that is, um, is very good for Walmart because that's, they keep innovating and they keep having the lead in this, uh, in these terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. one of the biggest challenges, you know, the, the, the challenge here is, uh, our culture. Uh, and as you, most of you know us, Arturo and myself, you know, we're, uh, I would like to think that we're bicultural, but in general, the U.S. is more uh, honor code where you do things and if you don't do the, if you do something wrong, then you will have a, a you know, a huge or a big, uh, you know, punishment that that's in principle. Here in Mexico, it's a culture of advantage. So basically you try to, I mean, th people do things, but there will be one or two or many that will scan nine out of 10 items. So it's a big challenge. And that's why the rollout has been slower. And this is a, an initiative in general, these type of programs that have been uh, in project for at least 15 years before it was RFID, it didn't work, uh, you know, self scanning. It's, uh, it's news for us and you've had it for 10 years. So we'll have to see how, th how things move or if we have to go back to what it was before of having a cashier, just making sure that you can steal things. Yes. Yes, that's certainly a challenge. Let's see how it plays out in Mexico. Okay. So moving on to Lacomer as well. Uh, Lacomer owns four different formats. As you can see the, on the right, we have uh, the four different formats that they have. They have City Market, they have Lacomer, Sumesa, and Fresco. So basically Lacomer, um, accounts for 45% of their chains, of their stores. City Market accounts for 16%, Fresco 21%, and Sumesa 18%. But that 16% of City Market may seem low, but that's, uh, they're growing and they're a very good um, chain for specialized and gourmet products in Mexico. A group of e-commerce sales during the second trimester amounted to 7,198 million pesos, which is 346, 719 US dollars. And they had an increase of 1.9% compared to the same period in 2020. The Northeast region registered their highest growth in the period, as well as in the Fresco and City Market formats, which maintained positive growth with appreciables and growth secretaries continue to show strong increases. So La Comer is a, is a very good um, chain in Mexico, they have, they're growing. So it's, um, we expect them to, to keep growing and to gain more territory in Mexico. Then we have Soriana. Uh, Soriana, they have these different um, chains, these different formats. This is Soriana Hyper, which is a higher end format. We have Soriana Super, which is a middle to high end uh, format. We have Soriana Mer Mercado, which is like middle end format. Soriana Express, which is sort of like a high-end as well format. And then we have Mega, City Club, and Super City. Mega is a middle um, format, a normal, regular supermarket. City Club is a price club. They have only 35 stores in the country. And then you have Super City. And Soriana, you're going you're gonna to find Soriana stores mostly in the north, northern part of Mexico as well, and in the central parts of Mexico. So they're very well located in, in Mexico in key places. So you will find them um, to be very uh, wide. As you can see, they have 922 stores in Mexico. So well, let's move on to um, some more information about Soriana. We, have, we know that Soriana acquired Comercial Mexicana, the fourth most important retailer in Mexico. This was a huge change in Mexico. The acquisition includes 160 owned and rented supermarkets 
for a total amount of 2.6 billion approximately. So all of the formats that Comercial Mexicana own are Mega, Tiendas Comercial Mexicana, Bodega Comercial Mexicana, and El Precio. So the other formats, City Market, Fresco, and Sumesa, they remain property of Comer Comercial Mexicana or Comercial Mexicana. So they were not included in the transaction. They, what they're looking to do is to all of the Sumesa stores, they will be renovated into a Fresco or City Market stores. Fresco and City Market stores, as mentioned before, they are more to high-end formats in Mexico. So this is a strategy for Comercial Mexicana in Mexico to renovate these stores and er eliminate uh, the Sumesa stores and have more Fresco and City Market stores in Mexico. So what about regional re retailers? So as you can see on the share, the regional retailers hold 25% uh, as a total and Casa Ley is the one that leads the, the share in the market. Casa Ley, they have 178 stores. They are located in the Northern part of Mexico. Then you have Chedrawi, which is a, is, is a good chain in the specialized chain as well. And they are located more than the, in the central Northern part of Mexico. Then you have Calimax, which is also in the northern part of Mexico. So regional stores, they tend to, some, some, um, some don't look at them at the, uh, as, a, as a big players in the country, but they can have good volume and they can have good um, results in Mexico, having these chains. And on the local side, you have Santa Fe, you have MC, Super Compras, Super Gutierrez, Super Oros, and Grande which you have, as you can see, you have smaller, smaller stores. They have small, a small volume and they're located in mo mostly in the southern part of Mexico. And they account for only 3% of the share of the market. So um, more on the retail updates. So we have, uh, as we mentioned before, they are buying more from their phone. Um, the supermarket category has grown 40% in the digital channel. As, as I mentioned before, they, we are having more people purchasing online and getting their groceries online. Forecasts show that online shopping in Mexico will more than double from 2020 to 2022, reaching a total market valuation of nearly 18 billion. Another big update that we have in Mexico is that we just had Justo where in Mexico. Justo was launched in Mexico recently and it's a fully online supermarket without physical stores. So basically they have uh, an app that people can just get their groceries through the app without having, uh, having to go physical stores. They don't have physical stores. They will only have warehouses and, we ex and they're expecting to, uh, to expand in Mexico and Latin America. So this is, a, this is a new change. This is a big change because this is something that um, we think it's gonna be a trend. It's gonna become a trend in Mexico. So um, we'll see how, how Justo works for Mexico. So Marco, I'm gonna hand it over to you on the main hurdles when accessing this market. Thank you, Arturo. Uh, you let me the, you know, the, the boring part, but uh, uh, again, we've met many times. Uh, we have talk talked about it many times. But we think it's important to, to repeat this type of information, especially one is because, you know, we haven't seen each other in a year and a half. Obviously market changed, but there are things that remain the same or didn't change as much. The, th the first one, uh, you know, the, and the three points that I want to cover here are credit, the relationship with the Mexican market that obviously changed uh, in, during pandemic and legal protection. The first one on credit, Usually when you try to do business with a new partner or a new uh, importer, you will find this, that there are no credit references or agencies or companies just changed. That's something that is not that common, but it happens that probably you had a name, let's say uh, green uh, trade uh, in Mexico and they changed for whatever regulation was in the market. But they're the same principles, the same uh, same people, same, same infrastructure, but it just changed. But those are hard to do. And I, we understand that it could cause uh, uh, mistrust, I don't know the term. Uh, but basically what we ask you there is that you um, ask us or ask the Agricultural Trade Office for reference uh, about this company. 
we cannot and Wusara will not endorse any importer or any company, but we can tell you uh, specifically what, what we have heard in the market uh, and what we have uh, seen in the market. You can ask for financials. That's something that is very common in Mexico. I know that in the US is not that much, but you can ask for their financial statements and, and references in the market. And we always ask you to do your due diligence or you know, follow the process because we have seen seasoned and experienced exporters having problems with collection. Uh, and that happened at least to us, we saw that twice. Uh, with uh, importers that we have worked with in the past. We have worked for many, many years. And uh, at some point they just stopped paying. I, I think that they are you know, in talks again to resume their, their relationship. But what, I try, what I'm trying to say is that even well-established and, re and reputable companies can fall behind on their payments or they can be in, a, in, in any kind of situation. Just be careful on that. Uh, they, you know, the credit terms in Mexico are uh, I would say the buyers will always ask for a much longer term than what you are in the, used in the U.S., but they are used to to purchase uh, in advance uh, for the first five or six or ten uh, transactions. So the first one, take care. The second one is you know the the contact that we are having or that we've had. What you're feeling in the U.S. with COVID, we're feeling just the same. Uh, we're right, right next, right next to each other, and uh, you know I've been traveling to the states recently, and we what what you're what, what you're feeling I think in general is the feel that we have here. The difference is that people are starting to go out uh, more, and you know with this uh, Mexican uh, feel, uh, you know more you know festive and whatnot. But uh, the, again, as I said before, the marketing is opening real quick. So people will be ecstatic to see you. You know they will be very happy to see you, uh, but then the 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 pressure to close the year, the uneasiness of being in person, that could affect in the short term. Uh, we have a trade show next week, which is ANTA, the National Retailers Association's trade show, and we we don't know what to expect. We've done that show for 15 years, and we really we we really don't know what to expect. But what we have seen is that there is less traffic, but more professional, not so, not so many consumers. So we'll see how that, how that happens. Uh, we have a, a trade mission going to the States. Um, we see you know, people are hesitant because of the time of the year, because of the uh, economic situation, not so much because of the, of the pandemic. I think we're, we're getting past that, unless we have a crazy variant that, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, but, you know, that will take us time to reestablish and, and, and try to see what, what remains and what it will be similar to before. You know, we think that Zoom will not be the norm anymore. Probably people will move to Google or any other established uh, systems and move out of Zoom. That's something that we have seen and they're, they're forecasting too. Uh, but also the one-on-one -on -one contact will be very important. So, again, uh, just uh, start thinking again, you know, start thinking of going, of coming to Mexico and have Mexicans hug you, which at this point is very rare, but that, that could happen. But again, timing is very important. And also legal protection, as I, you know, it says commerce codes are not corresponding between our countries and transactions are not covered in both countries in general. But the, with, the, with the change of the trade agreement a couple of years ago, there is more protection for US companies. But again, take care, just you know, be careful on the credit side, establish a relationship, but also have legal protection. And if you can, hire a legal consultant in Mexico so they can guide you through the process. Just to give you an example, a review, uh, you know, a contract review in Mexico will cost you $150. Uh, I think in the US could be far more expensive. Uh, so the fees are not that high. Uh, we don't have anybody that we could really relate or you know, recommend, but we can ask the embassy. Uh, but again, we ask, ask you to protect yourself, uh, protect yourselves when coming to this market. We have uh, 10 minutes, so I think we can cover it. Next one, please. Oh, here we go. Uh, well, this is uh, you know, the boring uh, part. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, where will you deliver? Based on our region, you know, the Western states, you know, most of the samples will go through San Diego, Nogales, or Laredo. And why Laredo? You know, Laredo is on the other side of the, of, of the border, but that's the, large, the, the highest or longest or largest or biggest uh, crossing point between Mexico and the US. The infrastructure is there. So at some point you need to make the quotation uh, delivered uh, DAF, delivered at Frontier in Laredo, Texas for general items. I would say, you know, for processed foods, that's uh, the norm. That's where most of the importers have their customs agents. That's where, uh, uh, you know, fees, you know, to, uh, freight, inland freight is more efficient. Uh, so that's something that you can get. Now for produce is Nogales, Arizona which uh, is, you know, basically that's where the Mexican product also crosses to the US and where produce comes back in. They are more, uh, they have more information on phytosanitary, um, uh, you know, regulation. So it's easier to go there, but you can use either one of them. So again, we recommend Laredo or Tijuana, San Diego, Tijuana, uh, depending on the region, or use uh, Nogales. Now, uh, the last point here I missed. Uh, we obviously we want you to be successful and ship as many full loads as you can, but it will take time. And I'm talking probably about years. This market can be very, uh, a very good market for you. Uh, obviously there, uh, you know, the, it is still price driven, even though there are many importers that are looking for differentiation or uh, convenience. But when you start, there are, you know, there are several stages that you will have to pass. And one is sending samples, and that's the final part of this seminar. The second is sending uh, pallets and then sending uh, truckloads. Again, that can take time. If your product is good and successful, which I'm, I'm sure it is, uh, you know, the, the, the learning curve can be shorter. But again, there are other variants or there are other factors that can affect you seasonality, exchange rate, and over time, we have seen that what drives the market is exchange rate, not, you know, price or, you know, anything else is, is exchange rate in general. So right now we see a bit of a spike. It will happen in the next months with the economic situation as we have, you know, increasing inflation rates all around the world. So we may see a, a bit of pressure in exchange rate. So make sure that you monitor it on a constant basis. You can do it with your stocks. If you have them, uh, you can just put the, you know, the index and see if it's going up or down. Usually 10% is the, the, you know, the signal that things can, you know, it would be a yellow light now that we're on the traffic light uh, fashion. And we go to the next. I'll try to go faster so you can uh, land the plane. Okay, next one, please. Oh yeah, sure. So your product obviously takes time, it takes, uh, you know, it travels and it takes, uh, you know, it, ha it has a cost associated. We have a landed cost analysis that we can share to you, or you can ask Arturo or myself to help you with that. So your product in point A, let's say Washington state costs $5 uh, free on board, but it will obviously the ship, the, the, the freight coming down, the taxes, tariffs, duties, everything that has to be paid and the, the shipping, the shipping into Mexico, uh, the sales tax and the margin for the importer and or the, the retailer will probably double or triple your, your X works cost. And that's natural and that happens everywhere around the world. Now your product will go downwards, obviously because we're below the US, but usually it comes down to Mexico City. That's about 70% of the, of the market. That's where most of our products come and they can get re redistributed uh, to the south, or maybe they can go back to the north, depending on the supply chain of, uh, of the retailer or the importer. Uh, just to give you a, a comparison of costs, uh, Mexico, Tijuana, you know, you're talking about $2,000 for a full truckload. Uh, for a short distance, considering that before pandemic, probably that's what, you, that's what it costed you to ship to China or to Asia. Uh, now we know it's far more expensive but you can, you, it can give you an idea, okay? Next. Now, um, you, you, want to, you want to do this, Arturo, or do you, do you want me to? No, it's good, I can take it. 
Thank you. Okay, so the main comments that we receive okay. from Mexican buyers right now, be patient, it takes time to list products here, especially right now with the pandemic. Uh, it's it's going to be take it's going to be taking time as Marco says it's going to take time. Oh, I think we have technical. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, you you cut. For... Sorry. Okay. So orders are, gonna, are no larger first. So we need to try product first as well. Samples, which we will we will covering soon, and the exchange rate has increased dramatically. Purchases are conservative, but overall consumption is not affected. So let's move on. Okay, so now we're moving on to samples. So on samples, we've seen that one of the best options that we have is DHL. Sending samples via DHL is something that we've seen that most of the importers recommend and do. Uh, is you, for it, you have to include an invoice without commercial value, and if possible, accompany it with the technical sheet so that they can classify the product in the correct tariff section. So basically what DHL does is they classify it and they make the, uh, the import process into Mexico. So having a technical sheet will help them identify the product and classify it correctly. And this will avoid having more time, have it, having it more time in the, uh, at the border or at the crossing point. Also, it's very important to maintain constant contact between your shipper, DHL and the consignee for any type of, of reasons. You know, sometimes they will requ require a document, sometimes they require a fee payment, something like, something like that when it comes to shipping samples. So DHL covers most, all of Mexico, sorry, it covers all of Mexico So and your samples can arrive safe. So this is one of the best options that you have when sending samples into Mexico. Another option that you have is sending samples to a customs agent. Yes, it might be quicker, but you can expect a higher cost. Um, also, uh, they will require an invoice without commercial value or include the lowest unit price. And they usually also help with the Sagarpa or Cofe Priest inspections and permits if needed. They will cover that. And DHL will sometimes not cover that. So you will need to tramit that in, in case you need it for your products when entering Mexico. And they also usually ship from a warehouse in the US border to your desired destination in Mexico. So most of the services provided include unloading a destination. We recommend to review if it's included, uh, the, the unloading at destination. Also, one thing that we've seen uh, in, when sending samples to the border is companies using USPS. Sometimes USPS is not as reliable as DHL FedEx or any other um, postal service. USPS would normally, um, we have seen cases where samples get lost because USPS just dropped them at, at, uh, at the wrong location or they don't really care where they're dropping it. So we recommend to use DHL, FedEx or any other postal service when shipping your, um, your samples into a warehouse, either in, in the US border with, with the customs agents or when sending into Mexico. Samples is a, is a also, you know, in Mexico, they have, we have not a very well developed uh, cold chain distribution as well. So if you're doing cold or refrigerated uh, the, uh, samples, it's going to be, a, you can expect a higher cost as well as uh, on the alcohol. Alcohol and refrigerated items, frozen items tend to have, tend to be more uh, expensive than dry, dry items in Mexico. Why alcohol? Because they sometimes need, uh, need to cover a, pay, a fee with that uh, alcohol has, has in Mexico. So also uh, on the sample side, uh, we've seen that uh, of, of the Laredo option is one of the best, as we mentioned before, for groceries and dry goods. Um, I don't know what else, Marco, can we add on, on samples? What do you think? What am I missing? Well. I, I think in general, you know, the three, the, you know, we gave you the, 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 the example, but the one before the DHL option, this, this is something that has been a challenge always. We have heard many exporters shipping their samples using FedEx, uh, DHL, or UPS, and usually they, the, the samples get lost, or you have to pay a ridiculous amount to, to release them. So one of the things is that we will start trying this option of DHL because we've heard this has changed over the last year and a half. 
So Arturo, do you want to offer our? You know, do, you, do you want to talk about our game or later, later, uh, later in the seminar? Yeah. yeah, I mean, what we want to do is we want to start trying out this option. So basically, the first um, company that um, sends us an email or or is interested in this in having their samples sent into Mexico free of charge, we will be making a making a, a the process of bringing samples into Mexico. So if a company is interested, please type it in the chat or send us a question or send us an email. And we will be uh, doing the process of bringing your samples via DHL, helping you bring it to Mexico via DHL without charge. So that's one thing that we're offering you to help to have samples in Mexico. And so basically the first one that uh, sends us an, uh, a message will get your samples into Mexico free of charge. So yeah, obviously, on. obviously we want to be reasonable. So just uh, <laughs> no, we want to be reasonable. So we're not we're not talking about a pallet. We're talking about a pouch. Too. Yes, I knew it would be you, Baman. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't disappoint. Great. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Okay, Baman, you just earned yourself a sample shipment into Mexico. Thank you. Okay, so moving to the recommendations. Always package your items with lots of foam or air bubble to avoid breakage. Boxes need to be reinforced for international courier travel. Of course, we don't want uh, any damage, any damages on your products. Please write or sticker fragile to the box or refrigerated frozen if it applies. Um, if sending perishables, make sure you pack them with lots of blue ice packages or dry ice, dry ice to make them last at least for 48 hours in transit. This will help your products arrive in good conditions to Mexico and will assure that your buyers will be tasting your products in great condition. Okay, so it's now a Q and A. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them at the at the chat box, and we will gladly assist you and answer your questions. Okay, I think we covered it. We don't have any questions. Thank you, Baman. Okay, so I Anybody think else? if we don't have any more questions, we give a, a, a minute. Mm -hmm. Anybody, any question about the market? Sure, you can get can a copy. Get a bit, yes. Um, done. Okay. Uh, and obviously, it looks like you know we've been talking about this uh, in general. Uh, we stopped doing webinars for obvious reasons, but now we are planning to go back to in-person uh, activities. Actually, we're planning to do a trade mission coming to Mexico and Monterey in December. Uh, I think we even have a waiting list, but I don't, I don't want to discourage anyone from participating and then logging it on to usara.org uh, to get their account and see the events. But in general, the market, as, I, as we've been repeating, it's opening. So we are having this event in December. Uh, obviously, we are, we're very optimistic about it, but we know that because of how fast the market opened, uh, we, we can have challenges. But that will be the cue for us to start doing more activities next year. There was or there is a large trade show happening next week, which is the National Retailers Association trade show. It's October, but traditionally, if, traditionally it was done in March. We have not heard from the organizers if they're, if they're gonna go back to March or if they're gonna move it to July or October. So we'll keep you posted. We'll talk to the Busara team. I see, you know, I, I, I see many of our uh, partner states uh, here, but we'll let you know in case you need more information and just let us know if there's anything else we can do to help. Arturo? Yeah, uh, just, I think we covered it all. So, thank you all. Uh, do you want to finish? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you all for your time. Thank you as well, Christy. Uh, we hope to see you soon. And uh, I don't know, Christy, if you have anything else to add. Uh, 
just one thing I just want to let everyone know this video will be available on wusada.org um, if you would like to watch it again or um, have another wusada company watch it uh, we can also send out that link and uh, Mark and Arturo you're, you're okay doing the presentation if I send out the presentation itself in pdf form yep we'll awesome. send it over. that's it just wanted to let you know that Great. Perfect. Thanks, Douglas. Thank you. Thank you all. Perfect. Okay. Have a great so, day. Yes, we'll do. Just quick, quick answer. Uh, we will do on that next year. Bye. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>